when you start looking at the numbers and you go, oh, a thousand people is the Hollywood Bowl. At, like the, a thousand people is the Hollywood Bowl. 10,000 people is like a small minor league stadium. 20,000 people is a staple center. You just start realizing like, oh, that's I don't a need- a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Yeah. You get 20,000 views on a video, you're selling out the staple center. People you literally don't think are of that, selling though. out the staple yeah. center. People don't think about that. They go 20,000. Yeah, oh, I okay. want 100. I want a million. Uh huh. It's crazy. We're all hundred thousand. that too. Yeah. Even at 100,000, like people don't consider 100,000 super viral. 100,000 people is Coachella, main stage Coachella. Yep. So for me, I'm like, really get clear on what is the number? How many people do you really need for you to be like, I'm making an impact? And for me, it just became so clear. It's like, dude, 10 people in a room. If you're talking about something that you genuinely care about and 10 people listen, you're like, that was cool. Like I got 10 people in here that are walking away with some real information that they're gonna go and implement. I'm Tom Ward and over the last couple of years, I've had the chance to sit down with some of the biggest celebrities and influencers in the world. What I've always found most fascinating is the stories of the businesses that they've built behind the scenes. On this show, you'll get an inside look of what it takes to build a successful business from some of the biggest celebrities, business people, and up and coming entrepreneurs in the world. This is the Tom Ward Show. Hey guys, welcome to the Tom Ward Show where we talk to the biggest entrepreneurs in the world. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications. New interviews every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Make sure you subscribe to my newsletter. Link in description where I drop knowledge learned from entrepreneurs like JT Barnett. Now you are a content creator, you're a brand advisor. I'm excited to sit down with you. I'm stoked. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thank you. And welcome, yeah, welcome. To the <laughs> We're at your welcome. house, it's a beautiful house. It's great. Now. The buzzword that I hear over and over again is community building. That's all in 2023, all anyone talks about. And actually, I think in my last thumbnail, Lubin, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think community was in the thumbnail. That's Is that the number one thing brands ask you now is how do I build community? Yeah, because I think like if we're talking specifically for brands, like it's harder now to acquire a customer just by paying for it. And I think what the differentiating factor is, like, you know, you've talked to multiple people that have started companies that have been successful in categories that are very general. You have to get people to buy into something that differentiates you on a shelf when there's a million different products. And for me, that is like the actual community that you have. It's like the reason why people care about you. And so, yeah, like every, every company that we work with right now, they're trying to build not only an online community, like people that follow them that actually care about the content they're posting, but an in real life community, people that would show up to a meetup or will go in the store and buy that and pull their product off of the shelf. And so, yeah, community is the big word for me in 2023 for everybody. You know, it's funny, it, you, it made me think of uh, Dobrik's Pizza. I was down in that area the day they were opening and traffic was insane on Sunset. It was, I mean, for half a mile down Sunset. Yep. And when I asked David, because I interviewed him, I go, why would you... I mean, who wants to be in retail? Who wants to deal with a bunch of employees, rent, city permits, all of the headaches that comes with open, you know, having an in real life business. For sure. But he said, just like you did, community, like I get to see people and they're consuming what we just made. Like how For cool sure. is that? And if you think about the pandemic and everything going online, and there was like a lot of talk of like, oh, nobody's gonna shop in grocery stores anymore. Nobody's gonna go get clothes in a retail store. But then when things opened, it was like, everybody's like, couldn't wait to go back. Yep. People were like, I want to go see people in person. I want to get out of my house. I don't want to be in this room anymore. So then people are like, wait a minute. Retail actually has a play again. Like people are going to the grocery store. People are going and buying electronics or clothes or whatever in stores. So now there's like a, the pendulum is almost like swinging back to where retail has a big play. And I think like you just mentioned, getting people to actually be in real life with you and with your product is a level up than them just caring about the stuff that you're posting online. And so I think everybody's looking for like in real life advocates. You know, we were talking to before we started about like Zoom versus doing in-person things. And this applies to you, you know, if you're not a content creator, you don't own a business, just in relationships, right? You know, just with a coworker, it means a lot more, you know, if you're on five Zoom calls with somebody for an hour, I take a 20 minute coffee in person versus all the time spent on the computer. So in real life doesn't have to be around brands. I think just in life, it means more to me. Well, I mean, for sure. I mean, for me, it's like Zooms, you can accomplish things, but like the, it's almost like an, the energetic experience that you can have with somebody being in person. Like for I can sure. give you a high five. I can give you a hug. I can say what I, yeah, bro. Exactly, right. you know? And it's just, it's just a different feeling, you know? Like you can get, 
I do think that there's a time and place for the online. I think that like, I spend a majority of my time online, but I think that it, like I was mentioning to you, it solidifies it when you're in person. It solidifies the experience. Yep. It like makes it feel more like tangible and more real. Um, and I think that there's, and I think a lot of people are craving that after multiple years with people having to spend majority of their time online. Mm -hmm. Now, before you became an expert in content creation for brands, being a content creator yourself, and I want to talk about how you're teaching other content creators out there too, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but you were a hockey player, okay? You were a professional hockey player turned fitness influencer. So I guess my first question is, you're a young guy. Like, when did you start playing hockey when you were like professionally, 12 years old or what? No, I literally started... I, well, I started playing when I was two. Sure. As soon as I could walk, I was like, oh, you're on Are skates. you from Canada? My dad's Canadian. My okay. mom's Canadian. I was born in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Um, but my dad was a hockey player who turned into an agent who then turned into an executive in hockey. Oh, wow. So I literally was like born into it. Like I the, I got put on skates as soon as I could walk. And I loved it. I fell in love with it. It was my passion. It was what I wanted to do. I could name every person in the NHL by the age of like six. Yeah. It was it was my the thing that I loved. And when you turn when you're around the age of like your teens 14 15 16 you start looking at like where can i go play to get me the next level nhl draft is at 17 or 18. okay um so like the years leading up to that you're like where can i get the most exposure play with the best people um and like really level up 15 to 20 i lived in canada wow and after 20 was when i turned pro okay and so yeah so i played pro um, did that until I was 25 and then stopped. And then that led me into all the things I'm doing now. Wow. So you, you're done with hockey and then you decide, you know, I'm in the health and fitness. You've been an athlete your whole life. So, you know, about taking care of your body. So you go, okay, you know, around that time, YouTube's blowing up. You grew up on social media, you know, at your age. So it was just a natural thing. Like, okay, I'll just, I don't do think this. it was as natural as me going, like, I'm going to be it wasn't as natural as me being like, I'm going to do business and strategy and things like that. It was no, I more in the health and fitness. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was my, so my mom's a personal trainer. My grandma's super fit. Like wellness and fitness was like ingrained in my family. It was like something that I, that I genuinely have enjoyed. Okay. Training. I like doing, I like, even when I was younger, I would like doing yoga. I would like doing saunas and ice baths when, when I was like, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. What a weird so kid. I, I know. <laughs> so I enjoyed like taking care of myself. And then toward towards like the end of my career, when I was playing pro, I was always the guy on my team that liked making content and liked being on the internet. So I liked messing around, filming and taking photos and all of that. And I was very creative. I was doing music on the side. And then social media was getting to a place where you actually could build a career off of it. So like Instagram comes out and it's the first platform that you can actually build a business around what you're doing visually. Twitter was around, but that was all written. And then Facebook was around, but people weren't like actually monetizing Facebook. It was just like your friends and family that were following you and seeing it. So you weren't building big audiences. Instagram comes out and now you can build an audience for the things that you're doing. And so I watched that come out and it was like, oh. Did you see Bradley Martin at the time? He was like one of the first probably, fitness guys probably. I noticed on there. Yeah, you could see, like I saw like, you know, Jake and Logan Paul were doing it. And like, so there was a lot of people that were, that were like, were posting on Instagram. And then influencer became a term. And it was like, oh, like that's a thing. And at first it was like a very like derogatory term. They're an influencer. It was like, that's not a real thing. That's stupid. Now it's like completely flipped. But back in that day, I was just watching it and I was curious. And then I, and then as we moved throughout my career, then I met my now fiance and saw her go from doing modeling to being really interested in health and wellness and start like actually documenting the journey of it, showing herself working out and then eating right and habits and routines. And then I saw her literally build a business out of it. Like I watched it happen. And so when that happened, I was at a point in my career where I was kind of like already being done with hockey. I was living over in Europe. I was, I was playing in Europe. Um, and so I was at the point in my career where I was like, I'm no longer, I'm not like chasing the NHL anymore. It's not like it, it's, the dream isn't as much there. Mm -hmm. And so I saw her build this and I was like, that's what I want to do. So after my last year in France, when I was 25, I immediately went home and started doing exactly what she was doing, filming workouts, showing the things I was eating. And people were intrigued with it because I was already a, ho a pro hockey player. Mm -hmm. So I knew how to take care of myself. I was an elite, I was like a high level athlete. Um, Did you have a following at this time because small, of the hockey stuff? Small. Not big. Dude, my ho hockey's a very conservative um, in the sense of 
personality wise, conservative. It's the same it's way. It's the same exact they thing. They don't have big so social media. Yeah, presence. so they don't. So like for hockey, it's it's not like um, it's not like the NBA or the NFL where it's like guys are really building personal brands. I was a dude that wanted to, but I was also a dude that really wanted to like you know. Uh, make the team feel good. I was a very team centric guy. So if guys weren't doing it on my team and coaches felt like it was going to hurt the team, I didn't want to do it. So I didn't really talk much about like my on ice and like what uh, my in the locker rooms and all of that things that were going on. It was more just about the things that I was interested off the ice clothes. I was wearing things. I was eating places. I was going stuff like that. Um, Pause on that real quick. And I don't want to interrupt, but yeah. there's something good. You just said there, right? That you watching this can relate to that. I struggle with too. So you've got a normal job. You want to create content, but the coworkers and your boss don't think that's a great idea. Maybe they're laughing behind your back. Yeah. You know, at the time you went through the same thing. You probably didn't produce or do the content you wanted to for because your teammates weren't doing it. You probably felt like a weirdo for yeah. wanting to do this. Didn't feel like dealing with them. Do you have any advice for the person who wants to create content, but you know, they're, it's not against the work rules or anything, but they're just being held back by, I guess, what people think of them systematically, I think that the, the whole thing is broken because I think that one, we all need to get to a place where we're not worried about that and what the repercussions could be if you genuinely enjoy it. Number two is from a from a business perspective or an ownership perspective, your employees creating content around the things that they care about is a benefit to your company. It's not a negative. Net, net, it's a positive. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's the anomalies of people that are like, like when you look at athletes, it's like, don't be on social media because people use the example of like an Antonio Brown. But then that's an anomaly and there's hundreds of people that do a great job of it, but people don't look at that. They look at the one that's bad. So I think on both sides, it should be flipped to where it's, if it's something that you genuinely enjoy and it's in line with our company's values, do it. Mm -hmm. It'll, like I would, I love that my employees are posting and stuff like that. It's a benefit because I want people to see my employees and love my employees and it makes our company look better. Yeah. So I think that systematically, I think it's broken. I think it's it needs to be flipped. It's broken. But I would say if you are in that situation right now, do things that are like on the side. You can do it with a different, you can do it with a different alias. You don't need to do it under your company profile. You don't yeah. need to do it under your own name. You could make, you could be user 87364 on TikTok doing knitting and, you know, baking and it have nothing to do with like your own regular profile you know because i see that all the time i'll see like user 85923 and i click and they've got like a hundred thousand followers i'm always like why yeah. don't is that why they don't put their name maybe there's like a whole thing right now of, of the next generation wanting to be more like anti-alias or like having having our uh, anti um personal brand and having oh, an alias wow. okay so they do it under uh, like a fake profile and they just do whatever they want because of that like judgment of what people are going to think to me, I'm like, I, I think if it's something that you genuinely care about, I think the work to be done is embracing that and like showing the stuff that you genuinely care about. And that is when you actually can like turn it into something. Um, but I think uh, the, the main thing is people should be encouraging and empowering their employees and the people that are underneath them to do the things that fuel them mm -hmm. because it will in the end benefit you as a company. We'll talk about, uh, and I want to talk about this later, but this is a good time, um, user-generated content, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a brand, how you just said it's beneficial. So if I'm a brand, I go, okay, my employee's posting at work, some funny stuff. Okay, that could be good for the brand too. But then I'm also hearing that not only our employees, but our customers should be making content. We should be using that too. Explain how that works, because I, I don't really understand yeah, so that either. User-generated content is anything that is made by somebody that is a consumer of the product. So it could literally be somebody that went and bought it. It could also be they gave the product to somebody and they tested it out and then they made a video of it. But it's something that looks like it is, the goal of it is something that looks like somebody off of the street that is like an everyday human being that is relatable that the audience can then build a relationship with or can relate to and will care about the product more. Because, and this you, the reason why user-generated content is so big right now is because there's influencer marketing has been big for the past, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And within influencer marketing, a lot of people now have this preconceived notion that it's a brand deal, that you're getting paid to endorse this. Yeah. So therefore it's fake and it's untrustworthy. So what what is now rising a lot of times up, it is. Uh, uh, very true. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the times it is. 
Um, now what's happening is companies want everyday people off of the street to review their products so that the consumer has less of a bias towards it being fake or real and are more trusting of it. Makes sense. So that's why user generated content is so big right now. And there's a whole, there's a whole market for companies that do you, that find users to create the content around a product hmm. um, and just make like realistic content that the audience would enjoy. Hmm. So if we go back to your career as a, uh, your career as a content creator, it's everybody's dream. That's like the, well, you, I've seen you talk about it on your YouTube channel. Everyone go check out his YouTube channel. We're going to talk about it. Great creator tips on there. Thank you. It looks incredible. But I heard you talk about it there, you know, and everybody knows this. That that's kids' number one career aspiration isn't to become a hockey player or basketball player or model or an actor. It's mm -hmm. to become an influencer. So you're done with hockey, which is you're playing professional sport, which is, you know, a dream for many people, you know, myself included when I was a kid. So you do that. Then you get like another dream job. You're a content creator. But you stop do becoming a content creator really to focus more on the brand side. What did you like about being a content creator? And then the other side of it, what didn't you like? So I think that I've always, always, always been a creator. And I think I always will be a creator. I think that is my, that is the core to me as a human being, because I love taking something that isn't existing and bringing it into existence, which is the ethos of a creator. So I will always, always be a creator. My mediums will continue to change, which will be maybe it's video right now. And then maybe in 10 years, it's something in augmented reality. The mediums will change, but I'll always continue creating the it's it is, in my opinion, the dream job, because what's really underneath that is being able to do what you want to do and be in control of your life and your well-being, which is what I think everybody should aspire to do. It doesn't necessarily need to be a content creator. I think it could be a business owner. Yeah. But the, the in today's cultural um, uh, world, mm -hmm. being a content creator is the way to get the most attention at the sh with the shortest period of time and with the least cost. So everybody that is watching this has either an iPhone or an Android. Probably more people have an iPhone. Mm -hmm. With just the thing in your pocket, you can build a seven, eight, nine figure business literally just with that. It's crazy. It's crazy. My parents did not have that. Your I parents did not have that. I didn't have that as a young person. Yeah. Yeah. And so the opportunity right now to actually build something is like never before. And so I look at that as like, take advantage of it, like do it. And that's out, that's literally just purely opportunity. That's less about the actual enjoyment of being able to wake up and be on your own schedule and be happy and do the things that you love and get to work with people like you and get to meet new people. That's the thing that like brings me the real joy. But I think the opportunity is so crazy for people to pass up. You can build a business around the things that you have fun doing, you know? And so especially with something like TikTok that now the production of it is the the barrier to entry is so low yeah. that you're seeing people that are making billions, like really ma building legitimate businesses off of things like slime and yeah. like baking yep. and you know thing which is so cool whatever you like which you is could, so cool there's a, a, a two hundred thousand dollar a year business in almost anything i was i was i did a video last week and i it just popped in my head like if you're into drawing unicorns that could be a you know a six figure business. You know, also yep. you got a TikTok channel and a YouTube channel about unicorns, and you got your cool little unicorn hoodies sure. and stuff. Like, For it's sure. so crazy that I didn't have that. At and 20. I think the main dude, I just think the main thing is just like people need to find what makes them happy. And content creation, when you get it to a point where it's actually like becoming a business, you're able to build a business around something that makes you happy, that you enjoy. And if you are somebody that is working a job right now that you're not enjoying. There is now options, whereas, you know, for my parents, there wasn't the same amount of options. Like there wasn't the same opportunities. Granted, there was probably some, but it's to the level that there is right now, like people can work a job and come home and have hours and not need to pay for anything and just get on their phone and make content around the things that they really are. They're probably already doing them, your hobbies when you get home. Yeah. But like making content around that can actually build you something that can allow you to do what you really enjoy as a career. That's what I think people should be looking at. Well, and I completely agree. Number one, you know, right back at you. There's nothing I would rather do. In, yeah. My wife and my kids, of course, hang out with you guys is number one. But a close second yeah. is doing this. But even that can be a career. <laughs> like you can literally. You can be a family dude, channel. You're right. Want to talk about something that's super underrated? What? Stay at home dad 
filming content around family. Oh. Underrated and untapped market. <laughs> I'll be, that will be me. Yeah. Eventually, when I have kids, the, I will <laughs> go from doing business to being like, here's what I'm making for my kid for lunch. Here's how I'm dropping off. For real, because I just think- I have um, two daughters, bro. I play dolls better than any dad out there. I there mean, bring go. it if you're a dad. I mean, I, There's no one that's branded that. I put time There's in. There's no one that has branded that. That could be my channel. Yes, I could, could get brand Barbie brand deals. I mean, for real. <laughs> it's um, it's the things that you're passionate about. And like, yeah, you're able to do, you're able to do it on your own time and you're able to build on channels where there's attention that uh, can be grabbed. So you're right. If I was born 20 years earlier, I literally wouldn't be able to do this. I don't have a journalism degree, right? How, I, I didn't, I'm from New Jersey. I didn't grow up in Hollywood. I don't know famous people. There would be no, it wouldn't even be a thought in my head mm -hmm. to go to Paris Hilton's house or something, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm just a skinny kid from the suburbs in New Jersey, like 3,000 miles away from that world. Like, so that didn't even exist or it wasn't even thought of. It was, there were less opportunities, right? You. Out of college, you kind of got no career and you got a job and pretty much 90 some percent stayed within that industry. Yeah. And just grinded it out. Maybe well, they... there was gatekeepers in media. Oh, for sure. In media before, for anybody that didn't know this, if you wanted to get the attention that you get with a single post on TikTok, a million views, let's even just go even shorter. If you want to get 100,000 eyeballs on you, you had to go to one of the five people that owned all the major networks. Yep. Like, you know, like a like a magazine publisher or a TV network or somebody that's casting or for radio. That, or radio. Back in the day. Yeah, exactly. And you had to pay for that spot. You had to pay an enormous amount of money to be like, I want to put my advertisement here and or or my video or whatever. And they had to approve it. Yeah. They had to they had to look through the things that you want to show and be like, is this gonna apply to our audience, to our readers, to our listeners? Do we want to share this? Cool, we do. Pay us. Yeah. Now, or, or go on the other side. Okay, say say you want, say you're a creative type and you want, I want 100,000 people to look at me or read what I'm saying or, you know, hear what I'm talking about. Well, okay. You got to go to journalism school. Yeah. You got to grind it out, get a job at a local go station in yeah. nowhere land yes. in North Dakota, a small market, yep. kind of build it up. And then, then from there you go to Syracuse, New York, and then you yep. move to, you know, Coral Gables, Florida. And then pretty soon when you're 45, you get to a big market, right? And you make some real money, but you could now, just like you said, you know, I sound like a dinosaur saying that, but it's true. It now, is. literally with what's in your pocket, you can get a hundred thousand views on you like that mm -hmm. or a million and everyone I think can go viral at least once. And actually I want to talk to you about that. You yeah. said going viral is not the goal. I thought it was personally as a creator mm -hmm. and you know, you go viral a couple of times and then you realize, no, that isn't what I thought it would be. You know, mm -hmm. it's not the goal. So why, yeah. why isn't it the goal? Cause the person, cause everybody here wants to get a million views on their next video. Why is that not the thing to shoot for? Two reasons. The first thing is, if you do go viral for some, the way that it works on the back end, if you do go viral, now the platform thinks, because a lot of people like this video, it thinks that you are a popular account in this niche that yeah. you went viral in. So say something happens that you happen to catch on camera, like something hilarious, somebody trips over a ledge or something happens at home and you film that and you post that just because you're like, this is funny and people are gonna laugh at this and it gets 10 million views. Now your account is a humor and viral, whatever moments account. So, but we, but what you really care about is podcasting and thoughtful conversations about entrepreneurship. The next video that you post- They don't is give thought, a it, Yeah, the next video you post around that topic, it's like, this is polar opposite of humor and you know, whatever he filmed before. Yeah. We're not gonna show this to anybody. Yeah. And it's gonna continue doing that. So you're gonna have to now you're now you're chasing an uphill battle where you're working against what you thought was gonna work for you. That's the first reason. Hundred so percent. You don't wanna box yourself into something that you don't genuinely care about. The second thing is virality doesn't equate to people genuinely caring about you. No. Nope. So even if you go viral about entrepreneurship and one of your clips goes viral is something that you're, you're talking about. It doesn't mean that if it got a million views, a million people will show up to your meetup or are going to subscribe to your newsletter or going to send you a message or even go to my YouTube channel or even go to your nope. YouTube channel. What? And so therefore, I don't think that virality is really what people want, because if you doing this at home, if you 
posted 10 videos and all of them got 10 million views. Yeah. But nothing came from it. Not a person actually bought your product. Not a person signed up to your email. Not a not a single person subscribed. Not a single person left a comment. And you just happen to just go viral. You wouldn't be happy. Hell no. You wouldn't be like, oh, this is what I wanted. This is amazing. So what everybody actually wants is people that genuinely care about it and buy into what they're talking about with the subjects that they're interested in, the things they actually want to talk about. And that, and then, and then when you get there, I think people realize it's not that big of a group that you really need to like do damage. Like when you start looking at the numbers and you go, oh, a thousand people is the Hollywood bull. Uh, like the, a thousand people is the Hollywood bull. 10,000 people is like a small minor league stadium. 20,000 people is a staple center. You just start realizing like, oh, that's I don't need- a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Yeah. You get 20,000 views on a video, you're selling out the staple center. People you literally don't think are of that, selling though. out the staple yeah. center. People don't think about that. They go twenty thousand. Yeah, uh, I okay. want a hundred. I want a million. Uh huh. It's crazy. We're all hundred thousand. That too. Yeah. Even at a hundred thousand, like people don't consider a hundred thousand super viral. A hundred thousand people is Coachella, main stage Coachella. Yep. So for me, I'm like, really get clear on what is the number. How many people do you really need for you to be like, I'm making an impact? And for me, it just became so clear. It's like, dude, ten people in a room. If you're talking about something that you genuinely care about and 10 people listen, you're like, that was cool. Like I got 10 people in here that are walking away with some real information that they're going to go and implement. So that I is way better than having the million people watch the person you just saw trip in the street that you filmed. that was funny. For sure. It's way because those people don't give a fuck about you. They yeah. don't even know who you are. They don't click on your profile. They're not going to watch another one of your videos. They see it pop up on their feed. They hit like and they go on to the next one. 100%. So you, li you literally got nothing. And there's an endorphin thing because you've had videos go viral a lot more than I have. I have. It's pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. When you hit refresh and there's 2,000 more views on it and you hit refresh a second later and there's 5,000 more. Which is like, great. Endorphins if, going crazy. Which is great. If it's a byproduct of something that you genuinely care about, but if it's there's not, no better feeling than actually thinking about something that you're like, oh, this is going to like, I really hope this helps a couple people and posting it and it getting a ton of traction. Yeah. Then you're like, yeah, this is something that I care about. And now other people are resonating with. That's the goal. The goal should be virality as a byproduct of what you genuinely want to post and care about. Yep. If you do that and then it happens, then celebrate the out of it and be stoked because that should that that's what you want to happen yeah that's the way that you can really build but that people do it the flip people go oh i want to go viral and then i'll figure out what it is that i actually care about that's you know? what i did but wrong. first i'm going to get virality yep. and then i'll distribute it doesn't work like that no yeah so, so let's get nerdy we, let's cool. get nerdy right let's talk algorithms sweet you mentioned it before we don't know about algorithms. Talk about how, because the most popular platforms, let's talk about TikTok and let's talk about Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk TikTok because I think it's way more fun than Instagram. <laughs> so yeah. talk about how does the algorithm work on TikTok? What do we need to know and how do we work the system? Every algorithm is really another word for human beings. So it's human beings that are placing their attention. So what you really need to understand is how are people consuming this content? Okay. So on TikTok, what people are really looking for is they like, relatability. They like authenticity. They like a little bit more raw when I'm talking about production. They like a little bit more raw of a production than other platforms. For sure. Um, and they like to they like to actually like build a relationship. Like people are going on TikTok to get some sort of value. Every piece of content on every platform has to be valuable to the person. But on TikTok, they're looking to get some sort of value, but then they're looking to like relate to it. Like they want to like, they want to care about who the person is and what they're talking about then they don't care as much about that person being of status in culture, which is different than Instagram. Yep. Instagram was really built on, oh, that's like a, a person that's like notable. Yeah. TikTok is the antithesis of that. Which is where great. Which, which is, is amazing. Why it's fun. Which is amazing. Yeah. And why it's been so popular. People go to it and it's and it's different. So if to get really nerdy, the way that the algorithm works on TikTok is it's a discovery feed. So it's showing you things that are based off of your interests. It's showing you things that you actually, like if you go on, on TikTok, TikTok right now and you have zero people you're following, zero videos you've watched, zero things you liked, it's just gonna show you a bunch of random videos that are very viral, that have been shown to millions and millions of people to see which ones you engage with. Once you engage with those ones, it starts to look at, oh, he liked the comedy and humor and viral videos, so let's show more of those. Or on the flip side, he, he hasn't liked any of those, 
Let's try showing him business and entrepreneurship. And if you like those, then you start getting shown those more. That's why the, the page is called the For You page. It's content that is catered for you. So the more that you engage with things, the more you like things, comment on things, share things, those topics of those videos are gonna continually get shown to you. So as a creator, you have to make things that people want to watch. You have well, to make things- Well, that's easier said than done. For sure. Yeah. But you have to think about who is the person that is gonna be watching this and how do I make videos that they would actually engage with. Now, how do you figure, it took me a long time to figure that out. How do you figure out who the person you want to reach is? And then it's another question, how do you know if you're really reaching that or if you have to pivot and hit a different audience? You figure out who you really want to reach by sitting in a room like this and being like, let's visualize what is this ideal person? Like, what do they do? What's their morning routine? What are they struggling with in life? What person are they in their friend group? What kind of clothes do they wear? Where do they live? Like, what music do they listen to? What movies do they watch? It's just a simple exercise of just like drawing out what this consumer, customer, what this ideal person looks like. Do you know who yours is? They call them avatars. Do Absolutely. you know who yours I know exactly who mine Absolutely. is. Absolutely. It took a long time to figure that out. And I was wrong. When I made this pivot to business stuff, I had a very clear idea of this is the person who's going to want it. It's not that person at all. Yeah. And I'll tell you off camera who it is. It was like kind of shocking to me. Now there's all kinds of different people and I welcome you, whoever you are, if you're still here watching this. Well, there's multiple, you can have multiple. Yeah, yeah. The thing that I think that helps a lot is pick one to start because yeah. when you don't make content for any, when, you, when you're making content, what's the word? If you don't know who you're making content to, you're making content for no one. Correct. Because it's just gonna be so vague and so generalized and that people are gonna scroll past it and be like, this isn't for me, this is for somebody else, and everybody's gonna do that. Yep. So you gotta make it for one person, but the funny thing is when you make it for that one person, usually the values of it apply to so many different uh, types of people that it, uh, it it's applicable for different kind of groups. For me, a lot of the content that I make is for a version of myself, for a younger version of myself, mm -hmm. for a more entrepreneurial version of myself. And so I think that if you don't know anywhere, look at, Maybe it's a younger version of you that you're saying this to. Maybe it's a ver maybe it's literally the stuff that you need to be saying to yourself and it's the current version of you, but you're making it for yourself to remind yourself of what you should be doing. So I think you need the, the exercise is to get really clear on who that person is though. So then you can know when I'm going to film my content, like I have this person that's visually like in my brain, I know what I'm gonna say as if I'm gonna say it to that person that's sitting on this couch or that's in this room with me that's here. Um, and then the content gets really specific and then that's when it becomes applicable. Now talk about brand voice now for a creator or a brand. How do you find your voice? Let's talk about as a creator first because you're a creator educator and then tell me how do brands find their voice? All of it is literally understanding who that person is because so it's all wrapped it's, up in it's, that. Everything's, everything in business is relationships and communication. Yep. So in marketing, it's literally how do we communicate what we're selling or what we're offering in a way that the person will be able to receive it and receive it on their terms, not on our terms. That's why the best marketers are the best communicators. So when you're when you're coming up with this and you think about like, all right, who's my person? Okay, it's a college student that wants to get into entrepreneurship, doesn't know where to start. They're probably like, a, you know, learning business in school, but they wanna like do something on their own. And they're wondering, do I go get a job or do I do my own thing? You're like, cool, how do I talk to that kid? Not how do I talk to my mom? How do I talk to my wife? How do I talk to my best friend? Like, how would I say it to that kid that's here? And that's the way that you find your voice. Because your voice is, the voice is literally, what is the most applicable way for our end consumer, our ideal consumer to relate to it? And so that's the way that I do it. I, like the way that I would come up with my, my own voice for me is the way that I would speak to that person. But as a brand, it's how would I speak to that person in a way that aligns with our values? So the company's values, and then that, that human being's values. And it's just communication. So, okay, for a creator, I think it's easier. We were down, you were showing me your gym, which is bad before we started shooting and there was liquid death down there shout yep. out to mike and liquid death they have a they've done a great job of having a very clear brand voice you know exactly what they're all about by just watching a 10 second ad on facebook or a little TikTok video like you know what they're all about yep now i'm a brand i make uh sweatshirts okay this person out here who's watching if they're an entrepreneur usually it's a cpg type 
brand, you know, and people start with hoodies or whatever their thing is, unicorn t-shirts. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Cool. So they got their thing. They have no customers. They just put, in, you know, started an Instagram page. Now what? We don't even know who we are. We just started making t-shirts because we thought they'd look cool. Who are we? I don't know. I think I think you I think it should be in the beginning process of starting and like literally the first thing that we do for any of the products that we're launching, any of the things that we're doing is like, who are we doing this for? Okay. Because I think you you want to do you want to give some sort of it's obviously value. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be like, who is this going to be providing value for? And then how do we relate or how do we bring them even more of that in the way that we communicate this? So I think like for Liquid Death, like they're going after the people that don't give a they're going after the people that want to clash with what the norms are and yeah. be outliers and be like, oh, yeah, we're here and we're bold and this is the way that we do this. Yeah. And so their messaging and their branding clearly communicates that. And I think if in the example of the sweatshirts, first, it's if it starts as just like it's just a passion project, yeah. you're just making it for fun. That's incredible. Once you get to a place where you're like, I want to turn this into a business then I would either look at the people that have already been been caring about the sweatshirts or whatever it is that you're making or the people that you would ideally want to be caring about it. And then those are the people that you would think about. Who are they? How do we get clear on them and their values and the ways that they hold themselves? I think that's a great idea, too. It's kind of like, OK, you don't know who your customer is like, OK, in a perfect world, who would they be? What yeah. would they look like? Where do they live? How much money do they make? What are their hobbies? What kind of music do they listen to? Especially if you don't have a current customer base. If you're just starting out. And customer, consumer base, audience, whatever, it's all the same. Yeah. If you don't have people following you, come up with who you want. Come up with them and then attack those people by bringing them the most value and being the person that they get excited to see, the person that they feel like is is hearing them, is seeing them, is bringing them the most. And then that's when they actually genuinely care about you. And what's funny is I do this too. I'm not as big as you as far as followings and stuff go. So I can still see it, right? It's it's not, it doesn't get lost as much. You know, once a day, I'll go look through who followed me that day. For sure. And I'll look, I'll creep their, it's, I'm creeping your Instagram page if you follow me today. I'm going to find out what you're into. You know, what kind of music, what kind of concerts you went to, what kind of For clothes sure. you wear. I want to know everything I possibly can because then that just makes everything I do better, right? Because then I can give you exactly what you want. It's such an underutilized play. DMs. It's free. DMs and emails and in-person meetups and jumping on a Zoom with like, like literally going to your, going to 10 people that comment frequently on your posts and being like, yo, let's get on a Zoom. Get on a Zoom with them and be like, first of all, I love all of you guys. Thank you guys for commenting and being here. I got Is there chance. anything that I can help you guys with? Like, you guys comment, you guys give feedback, you guys give even just like a, yo, great post, thanks for posting this. Is there anything that I can help you guys with? And then after that, tell me more about yourselves. What do you do? What are you into? Where do you work? Oh, Jimmy, why are you wearing that hat? What are the brands you like? That's the research and development. Those are the people that are that you're making the stuff for or that are currently spending their time consuming. Those Companies are spend hundreds of thousands of dollars sure. to get just that. For sure. You can get it free. You can get it free. And I and and in the same era of like community building, those people will feel so great knowing that you actually care about them and want to learn more and help them. And like that is how you care that is how you build a community by genuinely caring. Yep. And it's funny, we let's talk let's talk Instagram now for a little bit, right? It, because it is slick, it's more slick, it's more polished. And you know, I'm a guy. I this one a female influencer jumps out. I followed her. She was a, an attractive woman, right? But eventually I unfollowed her because it was too much. Every single thing was perfect. I know what goes on behind the scenes. I know there was a whole makeup team. I know the lighting, there was lighting going on. It took a half hour to set up for this casual shot. You yep. know what I mean? I see through all, I'm like, this is a bunch of bullshit. Unfollow, mm -hmm. you know? I think you're right. She would, that that person would never invite me to a Zoom call and she wouldn't invite you to a Zoom call either. But it seems like you would. It seems like, you know, your favorite creators probably would too. And that's why you like them and follow them, I think. For sure. And I, I Instagram, it's it wasn't it wasn't a bad thing that people were so polished and perfect and all that on it. It was what got attention at that time. Yeah, for sure. So like in 2014, 15, 16, whenever Instagram was coming out, like we had just gone through, uh, economy had just gone through some shit. We're coming out of it. People want 
aspirational content. I they want to see people. Pe yeah. They want to see people that are living the life. Yep. Living the lives that they aspire to live. Yep. Doing it right, going on yachts and airplanes and da 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 and yeah. all this. And that content in the algorithm at that time was what worked. So Instagram creates this whole wave of influencers who are built on perfectionism and on production and like making everything look better than it is. Yep. Now we have this tipping point where that's happened for so long that after it gets to a point, people get bored of that and get tired of it and get a little bit burned out of it and start craving something else. Yep. Then TikTok comes out. TikTok goes in, in intentionally they do this. They go, we're going to we're going to show the polar opposite of that. We're going to show raw. We're going to show authentic. We're going to really endorse and hype up a girl from Carolina that is a normal everyday girl. Yeah. And show her as our uh, poster boy or girl and have them be the champion of our brand rather than somebody on Instagram, you know, like a Kim Kardashian or something like that, very glamorous. Yeah. And which is so cool, which is why I love TikTok. Exactly. It was intentional. It was, and it was wanted and needed at the time because we had gone through that whole period of Instagram of perfectionism and people were tired of it. And so it's, it's still, Instagram is still built on that. So if you look at content on Instagram right now, on Instagram reels, the algorithm is very elusive in the sense of most people don't know exactly how it works. It's trying to be more like TikTok. But even when you go and scroll, all of the content is way higher production way higher editing and aesthetic and all of that than TikTok is. Yep. It's just the way that the platform was built. It's so not a what, wrong thing. So what do we do with Instagram? I struggle with this. I'm sure you do too. It's impossible to grow on Instagram, right? I've been banging my head against the wall. It's so much easier on TikTok. It's harder than it was two years ago, but it's way easier over there and more fun. It seems like Instagram and Reels, and maybe I'm, I'm old, you know, I'm much older than you. When I'm on Instagram, I'm not there for reels. If I want reels, I'll go to TikTok. Yeah. Right. And the same thing with YouTube shorts for me. I'm there to watch videos and listen, I'm older. So maybe the younger demo is, is different than me. Right. But I still look at Instagram to kind of scroll through and guess what? I'm just reaching. If that's the case, if other people think like me, I'm just reaching the people who follow me anyway. Yeah. And just so you know, you're not reaching all of them. Yeah, right, you're meeting I think a small it, percentage of people I think are seeing it. Uh, so the way I look at Instagram so now is do? Instagram is a business card. Okay. Instagram is a modern day business card. If you or anybody, your videographers, if anybody was like, yo, here's what I do. The first thing I would do would be search them on Instagram. I wouldn't go on Google. Sure. I wouldn't go on LinkedIn. I wouldn't go on Twitter. I wouldn't go on YouTube or TikTok. You're right. I would go on Instagram right. and I would click through. I would click to see if I know anybody that's mutual, I would click to see things that they've been doing recently. I would click, then I would click their links and I would go to their website from there. So it's a, a modern day business card. You're right. There is opportunity to grow on Instagram, but it's just so elusive and it's very aesthetic and it's a higher production and it's just a little bit more challenging than the other ones. Granted, some people have, are doing it right now. There are people that are getting yeah. traction because there is organic reach there if you can figure it out. Um, but I, the things that I look for when I look at platforms of where I'm placing my attention is cultural relevancy. Okay. I like being where I think the, the, the pulse is and where everybody is actually spending their time. I don't feel like that is Instagram right now. I feel like it's moving. I do feel like there's people that are still spending their time there right now out of habit, yeah. but not out of enjoyment. Yeah. And so I like, it's like to I go, just have to check it because I always check it. Right? Yeah. I see my friends. I see my family. I see stories and things that people are doing in the day. Um, I don't see it currently. I don't see Instagram being culturally relevant at this moment. And I haven't seen anything that they have done in terms of updates or announcements or anything like that, that is making me think that is going to change. So that's where I spend more time on something like TikTok or YouTube shorts. Yeah. Where should we send our time? Yeah. So I, so right now what I think is I spend a lot of my time on, on TikTok. I think there is. Uh, very underrated attention on YouTube shorts. I think a lot of people True. are going there right now because a lot of there's a lot of hype around it being monetized. So people are kind of going to YouTube shorts and spending time there. I think there's going to be a big push towards YouTube longer format because we've now gone through a couple of years with these discovery feeds where you don't know what you're going to get. You open TikTok, you just scroll. You don't see a lot of people that you know, but you see things that are interesting and cool that you want to see that are in line with your interests. Mm -hmm. But you just don't build as much of a relationship on TikTok because you can't see them that frequently because for you pages all random stuff. Yeah. So I think there's like a little moment right now where people are kind of like, I love 
the content that I'm seeing on TikTok, but it's not the people that I want to be seeing because I've followed people that I like, but I don't see their content as much. So I think there's a little bit of like a desire to see friends or, and people, creators that you already want to follow. Mm -hmm. And on YouTube, people go on YouTube intentionally to search for, you know, like search your show or search yeah. me or search people that they care about. So I think there will be a little bit more of like a inclination to follow somebody on YouTube and actually intentionally consume their content. That's why I'm placing more of my attention on YouTube long format right now. And so what segue? Let's see, see how I oh, do yeah. this. Yeah, Perfect great. segue. Great. Talk about your YouTube great. channel. Yeah. So I like, I just think. What is I, it? What is it about? What's it about? My YouTube channel is, is educational content at the intersection of business and business and commerce. So I would say like, it's people that are trying creators that are trying to turn themselves into business and businesses that are trying to turn themselves into creators. So it's the intersection of that. Through all of that, I like to talk a lot, a lot about my own like personal endeavors, the things that I'm up to, the things that I care about, my own anecdotes in the ways that I've, the places that I've got to and how I've got here. So the goal of it eventually is for people to care more about me and my own personality and the things that I'm up to, to want to know more about what's going on in my life and my businesses than just informational topics. But I want to give the most value to the audience. So if they need help with understanding the algorithms or how to open an LLC as a creator, or if you need to, or taxes or anything like that, that's the stuff I'm going to talk about initially. Okay. So educational content and then a little bit of my personal um, endeavors. And, and that's so smart because why would, why would you follow me if you don't know anything about me, right? You've got to make, and that's what I always say too, when people ask for advice about giving an interview, I go, you got to insert yourself in the story. Mm -hmm. There's no worse, you've been interviewed before. There's no worse interview than, so you were a hockey player. Tell me about that when he stops talking. Next question. Yeah, totally. Right? Yeah, you, totally. You don't give a shit about the person asking the questions. Mm -hmm. You just care about the answers, right? Because you don't know anything about them. They didn't tell you anything about themselves. So just you're doing the same thing with, hey, I can't just ask you to follow me. Why? Because why? No, right. I got to give you something. I have to really give you a reason. And by the way, if you follow me because you like the content I'm delivering and the value I'm providing, you're probably going to care what kind of workout I'm into or yeah. what I eat for breakfast this yeah. morning or meet my girlfriend and for what, sure. what we're all about. And my, my enjoyment is seeing people that genuinely care about what I'm putting out and finding ways to like, to elaborate on things more to impact them even deeper so if they so if literally my entire channel is going to go where people want it to go so if they write in show us your morning routine i'll be like hell yeah i would love to show you that if people are like give us more finance tips or give us tips on the algorithm i will do that i would love for it to get more personal because i do think that there's value in that and i think people will enjoy that but i am doing the channel for the consumers and it will go where they want it to go. Is that, that seems like a great attitude. It seems like the right attitude to have to be flexible at the beginning. Do you see creators try to box themselves in too much and kind of put the blinders on and go, I'm making, you know, videos about this video game and that's it. I don't care if anybody watches, that's it. Yeah. Hey, Tom, we want to see you talk about this. Nope. <laughs> video. Do you think people... It's harder to grow if you are just doing the things that you want to do without knowing who you're doing it for. But that's not a bad thing. Like, if you're just passionate about it and you want to just create what you want to create and you don't care about growing, so fine. And people do grow up. It, it can reach a tipping point where all of a sudden you just stay true to what you're caring about. And then eventually people start caring about it. And then you see who cares about it. And then you're able to build from there. So it's not a bad thing. I do think that people can box themselves in if they are only chasing metrics. That gets that becomes the issue because if you are not, I always like to look at it, it needs to stay within a creative iterative process. There needs to be at least like 30% of your content needs to be testing, needs to be trying new things, needs to be do, doing things that aren't maybe like your core pillars of your content because you're going to get to a place 99% of people will get to a place where your main series will take a dip. The main thing that you're doing will just not resonate anymore. It's kind of gone stale. It's been, it's been crushing it for a while. It was your thing, but now it's kind of gone stale. Happened to me. It's true. Yeah. And if people are just like every view needs to be increasing, 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 then you end up getting to a place where you're like, oh, we're stuck now and this isn't working and now it's broken. So I always like to have 
30 percent 25 30 percent of the content i'm doing be testing brand new things that are out there that are different that are not the things that i'm looking at getting traction in this moment but are just test so that when this does go through a dip or when the main one or two things kind of plateau a little bit you can bring something else in and it refresh it and then you're able to keep going. So smart. Yeah. It's funny. I just, I interviewed the Bostics. I don't know if you know them. Lauren and Michael yeah. Bostics. They got a female, um, real strong uh, podcast network and they have a great podcast. But they were saying, she was saying the same thing. She's like, you know, if we do three or four guests in a row of a certain genre, I kind of get bored. And I'm sure if I'm getting bored, the audience is. So we'll just throw something random in, like a sex worker from Vegas, come in and just like <laughs> totally go the other way yeah. with it. Just test it out. Maybe it flops. Maybe people don't want to hear that. It's like, For okay. sure. And it, dude, that goes back to like the your own self-awareness and self-esteem around being tied to views and metrics. If it's tied to views and, met views and metrics, it's really hard to test because you're like, oh, my average, my baseline is 100,000 views. If something gets 40, this is a mistake and it re and it's me, that's the issue. Yep. You can't have it be tied to the views. It has to be tied to the process and the way that you're doing it and the value that you're bringing to people. And then you're able to just like really crank out things and test new stuff. And if, if something kind of like dips off a little bit, yeah, it's gonna suck if like your if your main thing takes a dip, that's okay. But don't you don't get stuck there. You're able to be like, cool, let's bring in something else it's not a reflection of me. It's just the way that things go. It's an algorithm that I don't control. And I'm going to try something new and then something else will pick up. You know, I interviewed Gary V and he, that was, he had, that was the one quote I really remember. He said, you got to trust the process. He goes, he told me, he's like, I made wine TV library. If you don't know, if you just know Gary, this version of Gary V, he was making wine videos in his dad's liquor store. And he goes, no one gave off mm -hmm. for 10 years he goes and i was just i just loved making the videos but if he yeah. you know if if he just looked at views and that's my self-worth well he would have quit probably after a couple months right for but sure. he grinded it out for years and look where he is now for sure and i think that's the trajectory i mean there's like one alex earl there's one emma chamberlain right you're not going to be them. I'm sorry, right? But that happens to one person that has that kind of skyrocket. Most of the people I sit down with, whether they're just successful entrepreneurs and aren't in this creator world, or they're creators, it's not that... But out. both of those people didn't intentionally do that. Correct. They were just being themselves. Yeah. Emma and Alex and David and all the people True. that are the big of the big were being themselves and it worked for them. And then they started to realize why it was working and then it turned into a business. True. So it, it first, you, you, you probably won't be, you know, the overnight massive celebrity success, but you could be your own version of that. Yep. You could be, you can, you are your own talent. You have things within you that people care about that you could be the Alex Earl of baking or knitting or unicorns or whatever, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But if you are just looking at virality and the numbers and chasing that you're not going to get there you have to trust the process you have to lean into things that you genuinely care about you have to know who you're making it for and really try to bring them the most and then that's the process now i want to talk to you about probably the most unsexy platform out there linkedin now you're an animal on linkedin how many followers do you have you. almost twenty thousand, yeah. which is insane right when i started doing more business content i started posting on linkedin more and it's wild at first you know, I had corporate jobs stuff. I just looked at LinkedIn as a place to maybe connect with future employers or for maybe a recruiter or something to kind of reach out to you. And I would never post on there because I've what my coworkers and stuff would think. Now I look at it and there's real, there's people like you, like creators are on there and there's like cool people on there. I see Paris Hilton on there all the time. Mm -hmm. Odell Beckham Jr. is on, on there all the time. I'm a huge Phoenix Suns fan because I live there. Yep. Chris Paul's on there all the time talking about his entrepreneurial stuff. It seems like it's a, it's like kind of a new LinkedIn. It's not like our parents' LinkedIn or like the yeah. old school one we think of. Like, what are you doing on there? Are you having I, fun? Yeah, no, I, again, in the same way of going where there is underrated and underpriced attention, I think that LinkedIn has been a big one because nobody's posting. There's like literally nobody's posting. <laughs> no. It feels like an empty hallway that like, if you walk in and just say something, like <laughs> everybody, even if they don't want to hear it, they hear it. Yeah. Because there's nobody, there's not a lot of people that are doing it. So there's not a lot of supply there. People are scrolling on it. Like so many people that I know that work jobs are at their desk, at their cubicle, at their office, yes. scrolling on LinkedIn. Most of them are scrolling on TikTok. A lot of companies, 
allow you to be on LinkedIn. They don't allow you to be on TikTok and Instagram. So people just scroll LinkedIn. So for me, I'm like, okay, this is a big opportunity for me to put business content in front of business people. So it it was a no brainer for me. So the way that I just started doing was I would watch one of my TikToks, then I would summarize it in my head of like, what was the gist of that? And then I would write like three or four sentences, maybe a paragraph of what that TikTok just was. And then I would schedule it. So I didn't have to actually like post it in the moment. I would schedule it on a scheduling platform. And I would just do that for like five TikToks a week. And I just started posting like five, six, seven posts a week that were simple, just written things. And it just started to like gain momentum because again, uh, not a lot of people are doing it. And the more that you do it, the more you're building momentum and the platform recognizes that you're posting. So now it starts to show it to more people. So it just starts to build. And now, yeah, it just started at one point, it just started to like really turn on. And so I'm really enjoying it. Nice. I think it's super underrated. And I also now having been posting now LinkedIn has reached out to me and is like, yo, we want to talk to you about being a creator on LinkedIn. So let's talk about this. So now having conversations with them, I know they're prioritizing creators. So I know it's not just me internally being like, oh, this is underrated attention. Now I know that as a platform, this is one of their critical initiatives is getting more creators to post. So now I'm like, oh, on both ends, it's a thing that I should be doing and everybody should be, you should be doing, everybody should be doing. Um, and now I'm just seeing that it's like, it's working and I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. It's fun. Wow. How cool is that? So do you, can you say what you're thinking or what are you guys going to work on together? Or? Uh, so, yeah. So one thing that they're post, what the things that they are pushing is for creators to talk about their creator economy and what they're doing on it and how they're navigating their life as a creator and business. Whatever medium it is that you care about can work on there. So if you are a person that's written, write. If you are a person that like posts video, post video. If your photos, post photos. They're agnostic. Whereas on on TikTok, it's video. You write a, something on TikTok, it's not going to work as well. On Instagram, it's now video as well too. So like doing a written just thing isn't going to work as well. On LinkedIn, they're less they they're less like preferring of written versus photo versus video. Sure. So everybody can win. So I think for me now, one of the things I'm going to focus on is I'm going to post a lot of the video content that I post on other platforms on the LinkedIn to see if that starts to work and generate some attention. If that works, I'm going to be posting two, three times a day, every day, because now I don't need to just write something. I can write it and post a video, you know, and post a photo. Yeah. So I think for LinkedIn, everybody should think about what are their thoughts around the different topics of business and even I even see people doing personal stuff now, just like yeah. things that the, people want to hear lessons and interesting thoughts and interesting things that have happened in your life. So if you have any sort of anecdotal evidence or stories that you want to share, go there and post it. And I will guarantee you that if you stay consistent with it, you'll build some momentum. And I don't know if it's true anymore, but I know a couple months ago, like, a bunch of people told me, dude, post selfies on LinkedIn. I'm like, why it did you cra- why it's crazy how that post works. a selfie on LinkedIn? You know why? That was like the most perfor- the best performing th- content yeah, out there. It's anti-culture. What do you mean? It, tick- uh, LinkedIn's culture is literally like, don't post selfies. Yes. Only talk about work. Only talk about successes. Yeah. That's why people posting selfies, crying, talking about their work immediately blows up because nobody does it. Yep. It's so counterculture. It's so different than what people are typically over the past 10 years post on LinkedIn that now when anybody does it, they're like, oh, this is like a fresh, different perspective that we're seeing on a platform that's supposed to be for business and employers. Like, cool. I want to know who this person is and why they're doing that. Yeah. So yeah, the more you're willing to do that, the more the people that I see crushing LinkedIn the most are all very transparent, literally like intentionally talking about the down or the challenges of their business, the failures, the things that aren't working the best, the things, the problems, the issues, um, and are just like very like raw, like very like real and like care about the, somebody writes in a comment and rather than just like thumbs upping it, they're like, yo, thank you for this comment. How's your day going? What's going on with this really cool post that you made last week? Like they just like care. And that's the way that you grow. You know, it's wild. And thought leaders were kind of like the, the beautiful Instagram models in like the business world, everybody. And I, I still, people still try to do it and drives me f-ing insane. I don't want your course. I don't want to go to your, you know, your meetup. I don't care. Yep. You know, Hey, everybody's built, you know, multiple million dollar businesses right now. I'm going to teach you how to do the same and buy this, buy this, buy this. I always think, if I had all these businesses, I wouldn't talk to any of you, right? Maybe I would. I'd be on a beach somewhere. I wouldn't be telling you how to do it. I'd want to do it over and over and over again and kind of keep that to myself. But the point of that is, you. I think I'm not the only one who's tired of these like kind of, you know, fake thought leaders out there and everybody's trying to do that. 
I think it's just like you said with, you know, the rise of TikTok is because it was less polished. And I think just like you said on LinkedIn, now everybody before was trying to super perfect. My career's going great. Mm -hmm. Home life's great. Blah, 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 blah. Now I just lost my job or I really fucked up my yeah. last job and this is what I did. Mm -hmm. And I think the authenticity on LinkedIn would have seemed totally fucking out there even six months ago to me. But now yeah. it's like. I mean, this could be a cool platform. You're right. The competition. How many people are posting on TikTok every second you have to fight and compete with? Yeah. Versus how many are on LinkedIn? I have no idea what the numbers are, but I'm gonna say a lot less on LinkedIn. For sure. I, I think the I think like there's a shift between thought leaders being on a pedestal talking down to you to now thought leaders sitting in a chair talking directly to you at eye level. Yes. And I think that's, that's what that's, we want. That's what people want. They yeah. want people to they want somebody to have a conversation as if you are a valuable asset to society and a dude that are like a male or a female or whatever to be looked at as one of you not a check not a check not, not a funnel he's not 40 dollars to me exactly yeah that's how i think a lot and of people think to look at us i mean dude that's it's literally how i think that my personal brand has grown on tiktok is because one i've talked about the challenges i've talked to people from my own perspective that i'm like here's just the way that i'm navigating this not here's exactly what you need to do and if you do this don't do this the right way you're wrong and this is the only way it's like, this is the way that it's worked for me. If it works for you too, I would love that. That's amazing. And so I think people feel that like, you can feel that warmth and you can feel that it's like another person that's talking that wants to have a conversation with you rather than me being like, I'm talking down to you. I'm the leader. You're not. Buy my course. Buy my book. Buy this. That's a buy, 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 buy my merch. Anything that ends in, and just right now I have a limited time offer for you for this exact thing. <laughs> it, it, it cancels out everything before that. For real. Every, and it can be, the tough part is a lot of the people that are selling courses and and really pushing them, they have a lot of value. I'm that, sure. That, and then the thing, some things that they say are very like tangible, good information. But when it's said with a KPI at the end and with a conversion at the end that is like, and just right this time for you, a limited time offer, every single person that sees that now goes, all of that that you just told me is bull and I don't trust it. Yeah. You know? And so for me, I'm just like, oh, you're doing, a lot of people are doing themselves dis disservices. So I think a course should be, a course for the sake of selling a course should be the last, 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 last business that you do. Yeah. Everything else should be a, a before that because again, if you're trying to build a community, having everything be a funnel into some sort of metric is the, number way one way to kill your community it's the number one way it's the, the, i put out a master class around tiktok for business i haven't talked about it one time to my audience because all of my audience is creators and i don't want them to think i am trying to do anything to get money from you i want zero dollars from you i don't care about your money i want everything to be free for you always and on the opposite end of it if you're selling something directly sell it don't do it with some bull before it yeah that makes it think like this is going to be free but then sell Bam! it for me, literally on LinkedIn, if you go back to the post, I'm talking about my course, I uh, my masterclass on LinkedIn, I literally wrote, I'm putting out a masterclass for businesses only. It's not for creators, don't buy it. Businesses, this is $3,400 for you. I'm selling this, this is a paid product. I have all this stuff for free. If you want something for free, this is something that is a business for me. It's not, I'm not alluding to anything. I'm not trying to do a funnel. I'm it's not, a way to do it. there's no bull around it. It's clear, this is a business. It's for businesses that have money to buy it. I'm not trying to pry on anybody that's a creator that doesn't have money that's n new and upcoming and needs things for free. Totally understand that. All my content for you is for free. So I think it's the, what people really, you can feel it inside where it's like, oh, this is like, it's almost like slimy. It's like, this is yeah, like, you it's almost me. like, yeah, you, tr that's what it is. It's like, yep. you tricked me. Yep. You said all of this, but at the end of it, you just want me to buy something. Yep. It's all bull. Just like that's, you said. That's what people don't like. So if you are somebody that sells, there's nothing wrong with selling. No. If you are passionate about what you're selling, sell, but do it directly and be clear about it and don't do it where Don't it's beat around the bush. Don't beat around the bush. Do it direct and do it clear. And I love that when people are like, yo, I just came out with this product. Like, hey, we're selling these bracelets. They're $24. Da, 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 da. You guys are going to really like them. All of these people have been wearing them. Please check them out here. I'm like, cool. I'm stoked on you. That's awesome. But when they're like, yo, have you been da, 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 da. Yeah. <laughs> It's just kind of like, uh, you know, it just yeah. kind of feels weird. And so, yeah, long winded, say to, uh, winded way to say, don't beat around the bush, do things with authenticity, 
um, provide value. If you're selling, sell, be clear about it and genuinely care about the person on the other side of that screen, then you will build something that will be long lasting. I think that's a great place to end. Cool. What better place? I agree. And I'm not trying to sell you anything. I just want you to subscribe. So if you like this conversation, turn on notifications. Do and news every if you do ever get to a point where you are selling something, that's, yeah, there's nothing that's wrong fine. with that. Oh, no, 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 sure. But you're clear about it. Yes, I'll be upfront with you. Exactly. I just meant I'm not selling you a course. I'm not a thought leader. I just appreciate that you're here. That's exactly. all. Exactly. Exactly. That's it. And make sure you subscribe to my newsletter. I take the nuggets learned from JT and others out there that I've sat down with about how to grow or start your own business. And I send them out once a week. So make sure you subscribe. Thanks guys.